Hello, hey you 11s. Uh, I am online two minutes early. Just wanted to pop be in a little bit early just to be able to say I hope you're all coping all right. Um, I know that it's a really difficult time at the minute with everybody. Everybody's struggling with this being at home and everything being really limited and everyone's feeling a little bit stressed and have a bit of anxiety. So I just want to pass on, you know, that I really do care. And if you need any support from me, do let me know. Give me an email. I'll always respond. I'm trying my best to be online as much as I can uh, to offer you guys some support. Um, anyway, so on to today's lesson. I'm already starting to receive emails from you guys. Um, asking me to go over certain topics, and I'm just going to be taking them in order. Who's that? Is that Ashley? Hey, Ashley. Oh, good to see you, Julian. Nice to see everyone now appearing. That's great. Um, yeah, so all I'm going to be doing is, you guys are busy sending me emails, and I'm going to be going through those emails, uh, going through those emails kind of as they appear, and just tackling them, going through example questions for the GCSE, and then tie them into the questions that I'm receiving. So the first one I got was just on some organic chemistry. I think a lot of people are struggling with the organics. It was done with a little bit of a rush at the end, um, I think, in some regards. And so I'm just going to be answering a couple of questions that I've been emailed from a student and going through them. So, okay, I'm just going to share my screen with you guys. And then drop into doing some writing. There we go. Cool. So you guys should now be able to see that. There we go. So these are the questions that I received. I got these off Oliver. Um, so this is just a bit of revision, uh, revision webinar on organic chemistry. As I said, we're going to be focusing primarily. Most of the time we're going to be focusing on so kind of learning objectives, really is just address, addressing the issue of kind of uh, being able to draw, draw isomers. Going to be looking at being able to understand polymers. Understand polymers. And uh, as I said, looking at questions, really. I also then want to be able to go through your questions and you guys can just ask me if I have any through the things. Just ask them on the chat. It's nice to see that I've got MJ here, I think. Oh, it's MJ who's who's Ashy Potato. I like it. And I've got Marella. Nice to see you guys. Okay, so these are the questions that I've got asked. Uh, and I'm just going to be going through them one at a time. And I have to say there are some lovely questions in here. And these are actually from Oliver. And um, so I'm just going to be going through them. So why are larger hydrocarbons ignite less easily? And I'll do spin-offs of each one and link it back to the exam questions. Why do large molecules have stronger, weakened molecular forces? What exactly is fermentation? And I'm just going to tackle these one at a time. So the first one, the first one, I'll try and make my pen a bit larger. The first one of why do hydrocarbons ignite less, less easily actually ties into number two as well. So as hydrocarbons get longer, now, by the way, just to say, so I'm going to put question one. And if you've put length, size of molecule, size of molecule. Now, he said a hydrocarbon, size of molecule, effect. And he put ignite more easy, more, more easily, affect flammability. And flammability is, uh, flammability, it is kind of the, it's the name of the property, really, that's given to the ability to ignite. So I'm going to put it into that context there. And notice that I've changed his words, uh, changed his word. He put size of the hydrocarbon, I think. Yeah, the larger. And I put molecule. The reason why is if I have C3H8, double it and add two, so it's an alkane, it's nice for me to then go over our CNH2N plus two, the general formula, general formula for an alkane. And if I go for this one, of course, which is propane. And we look at, um, and we look at how the length affects the flammability. What we realise is that it's to do with the intermolecular forces. To be flammable, to to ignite, 
We know that liquids don't actually ignite. They don't actually catch fire. Liquids don't burn, gases burn. They need to be in contact with oxygen. So what that means is they're, um, you need to actually have the molecules in contact. Whereas as a liquid, there's no gaps between the molecules. We need this to become a gas before it can actually burn. And that links into the intermolecular forces. Now, if I make any chain longer, so if I go from propane and I extend the chain, C6, let's go for hexane, double it in our 214, that would be less flammable. It would ignite, ignite less easily than propane would. But if I can do the same thing, though, I can do the same thing for alcohols. So if I have CH3, CH2OH, if I have ethanol and I then extend the chain compared, I'm talking, let's just do verses versus C, CH3, uh, I'll now give a gen, uh, this is where of course it now becomes tricky, doesn't it? Because I have to draw them all out. I could do C, eight, H, uh, double it in minus ones, 17, O, H. I hate doing that, but I can. So this is octanol. That will be less flammable than ethanol. And the reason by being is because it, its boiling point also increases. Tib is here, Liz is here, I was here, that's great, so good to see you guys. Um, so, the bigger the molecules, the higher the boiling point, if the higher the boiling point, the less flammable they become, because they're going to struggle turning into a gas. That's actually in reality what's going on here. So, and what we really need to do now, so if we can now say we can answer each of these questions why by nice lightness they have higher boiling points answer they have increased boiling points and if you've got an increased boiling point that means you're going to ignite less easily because you don't turn into a gas as readily so then we need to explain the why they have a higher boiling point and that leads me to question number two so question number two says why do they have stronger intermolecular forces? Now, can I just point out, Oliver, that this question actually is straight out of AS. It's out of A-level chemistry, not GCSE. And I, I don't want to go into the details of what intermolecular forces are. I def definitely do not want to start getting into those kind of conversations because I feel like it's only going to make this it's only going to make this much more complicated and harder for students to manage. So. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna remind you that so in reality weakened wimps I like to call them wimps weak intermolecular forces shouldn't put a dot on its capitals weak intermolecular forces uh, weak intermolecular forces are actually dictated by the number of electrons that are in the molecule so the size the bigger the molecule the more electrons there are the more electrons there are then the stronger the intermolecular forces. This is actually due to the way that the, the electrons are actually fluctuating in the molecule, causing what are called temporary dipoles. But you do not need to know any description of this. You just need one fact, which is the bigger the molecule, the stronger the intermolecular forces. That's fine. I thought we needed this for exam, but good that we don't. Yes, absolutely. But you do need to know that any increase in size will increase uh, the boiling point because of you and the key words which are really tricky for students to say that the weak intermolecular so bigger the molecule let's just do an answer for this bigger bigger molecule bigger molecules bigger molecule mm, missing letters that's all nightmare isn't it bigger molecules stronger stronger I am uh, W I M S wimps. Stronger, weak into my. You can't write that down in your exam, but I teach that because it, it just for me makes a big difference in terms of the way my mind processes it. Uh, and so, if you, the, the picture, of course, would be something like this. If we do um, C three H, let's go for propane again. C three H eight and two C three H eights. There are my wimps. Yeah, and the bigger the molecules, the bigger the molecules the stronger those wimps are going to get. Yeah, and so this would be something like octane, double it and add two, 18. 
So that's all you need to know. And it translates across all families. All families this translates to. Okay, so, and, and as I said, no explanation is needed at all, which is a good thing. No explanation whatsoever. I'm just fiddling around with my setup, trying to stop things from falling over. Okay. Okay, so if we go, so if there are any questions, um, what does WRMS stand for again? Weak Intellectual like Forces. Thanks, Minwee. That's great. Thank you, Hamster. <laughs> Mel's here. It's great to see you. Okay. So that translates across any organic. So we can tick off this one. So these two go hand in hand. Yet yeah, higher the boiling point means less able to turn into a gas, meaning it's going to be less flammable. What exactly is fermentation? Okay, so let's do question three. I like that. So question three, fermentation. So fermentation is the name given to a very specific process in chemistry. And can I just point out, it has huge, of course, biology links. This is very much based on a biology process. We know that if you take a source of sugar, now we, of course, in chemistry, always tend to use glucose as our source. Yeah, but in reality, this is any, any sugar source. Sugar source. So that could be carbohydrates. It could be almost, it could, it could be any carbohydrate. The use, this question does get asked as well as kind of why is it, uh, or name a source that the sugar's coming from. Yeah, and the source of sugar would be something like wheat for beer. It might be grapes for wine. Is that how you spell wheat? I think so. Grapes for wine. You might have um, barley. Barley. Lots of different sources of sugar. Um, and when you then add that to, sorry, my laptop fan is going crazy. I'm sorry if you can hear that. Maybe you can give me a bit of feedback as if you can hear that noise. So if we now take that and we have to do a reaction, notice there's nothing else going in. There is no air. Yeah. And we need a yeast catalyst. Yeast catalyst. Yeast catalyst. If we do a yeast catalyst, what will happen is the ferment, it's, it's this specific name of this process, it's going to become CH3CH2OH. It's going to turn into ethanol. Yeah, and this is our ethanol. And the major use for ethanol, of course, is a fuel. You're not allowed to say we drink it. The second use would be something like um, using it as, a, as, as a cleaning agent, a sanitizer, maybe. That's always a good one to go for. Um, and of course, we're also going to get carbon dioxide, and then we need to balance that. So, fermentation is a specific process that makes alcohol. Now, so what exactly is fermentation? A process to make ethanol. What, that is a very specific one. You, there are other fermentations, but they're incredibly rare. Um, and I've never seen any question, can't hear the noise, which is great to know. Um, there are, the, 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 there's never been a question based on a fermentation that's outside of this produ production of ethanol. Um, but this microbial oxidation fermentation is very different. Um, microbial oxidation, now you've put fermentation on the end of this. The reason being is that, that there is not an is that an oxidation process? It's in the absence of air. Um, it probably is actually. It probably is microbial oxidation. I've never heard it being called that. Now, when you ask that particular question, what I often think about is the idea that 
Um, this, oh, by the way, 30 degrees Celsius. So this process here is very much man-made. We are, we are doing this deliberately. That's what we're doing. And the thing is, we also, um, we also come across fermentation happening as, happening as a natural process, not something that we're actually doing on purpose, but rather it happening kind of spontaneously. So for example, if you leave food out, if you leave food out, such as um, fruit, for example, if you leave fruit out, it will naturally ferment because there's actually microbes in the air that can do the fermentation process. Now, when you then say the word oxidation, what you're doing is you're, you're I'm tempted to say it's the process of wine, of ethanol, ethanol becoming uh, ethanoic acid. That is what I know as microbial microbial oxidation rather than micro, microbial fermentation. This occurs naturally. So when you open a bottle of wine and you leave it open, the microbes in the air will get inside. And once they're inside, they're going to be causing oxidation, which will then turn your ethanol into ethanoic acid. They're not doing fermentation. They're doing an oxidation process. And that's very different. And I'm just... And that question, Oliver, requires a little bit of clarity. And I'm going to see if I can find a, a question regarding that on an exam. Um, and so I'll, I'll come back to that one at a later date. What is the practical for making esters? So esters, so this is now on to esters as a practical. There is a practical for this and a very specific one at that. So we know that if you take, practical is you need an alcohol and they're going to most likely give you ethanol, not guaranteed, and you're going to see the questions in a minute. You're going to add it to a carboxylic acid. Carboxylic acid, probably ethanoic, although not guaranteed. Ethanoic acid, and you're then going to add, and this is the thing, this is another question, there is a very specific catalyst for this, a very specific one. And the catalyst is concentrated sulfuric acid. That's the one that you guys have to know. For this particular process, concentrated H2SO4. And that will produce an ester and water. Uh, just to also say, by the way, that the process is reversible. And it wouldn't surprise me, surprise me if Edexcel were looking to um, use this as a jumping off point for equilibrium. It would make sense for them to do that. Because um, you can talk about the idea that pressure won't make any difference here, but temperature does. The food reaction is, uh, well, it depends on the ester being made, but usually, uh, endotherm usually endothermic. So we're going to raise the temperature to try and shift it over towards the ester. And they do, they could use that as a jumping off point for this. Um, your question then goes much, much, much further. Uh, you are also going to need to heat this, by the way. All, all organic reactions do require heat. Uh, you're not going to heat it directly. You mentioned about the practical. What you would actually do is you would use probably a hot water bath. You would use a water bath with a heater, an electric heater an electric heater and you'd probably use a boiling tube where you'd have your mixture in there and you're going to heat it that way because you can't heat this directly under a Bunsen burner because it's going to cause you're going to produce vapors which are flammable all, all organic molecules are flammable so there's going to be an issue with that then so you don't want to heat this on an open flame definitely not a good idea with all these things being flammable so going back to your question you asked me, and I'm just kind of keeping up. I was clarifying if microbial oxidation constitutes as fermentation, which you explained that it isn't. Yes, well done, Oliver. Oliver, absolutely spot on. Hey, Bill. Hey, Sian. Thanks for coming. What is the process that uses phosphoric acid as a catalyst? 
Uh, that's the mating of ethanol. I'll come to that one. It's on there. So the practical, again, we'll look at questions for, but the practicals usually say they're going to be looking for you to have a good understanding of kind of issues involved in those practicals in terms of heating them with naked flames and all that kind of stuff. Why and how are some condensation polymers biodegradable? Oh, what a lovely question that is, Oliver. It's, again, beyond GCSE. It's part of A2 chemistry, this one. But I'm happy to explain why. So, so polyalkenes, we know that polyalkenes, otherwise known as addition polymers, polyalkenes are considered non-bio, non-biodegradable. Biodegradable. We know this. They are non-biodegradable. They are non-biodegradable. The reason why is because you start off with your, let's go for chloroethene, because this is an example you guys need to know. Start off with chloroethene. We're going to polymerize this. We're going to take an N number of those. We're going to polymerize it to produce this. This is our polyalkene. And this now is polychloroethene. So that's the polymer there in a bracket with an N. In a, in a bracket with an N. I'm trying to figure out a good way to cool my laptop. My laptop's really struggling with this whole thing. So this is now, this is now ethene, of course. This is ethene, this is polyethene. Polyethene. So the reason why it's non-bio is because the chain of carbons running down the center is an incredibly tough set of bonds. The CC bond, which of course is just continuous, just keeps going. These bonds, I'm, I can't not put sticks on. I've only done, I've done like two and a half repeating units, but I'll add another C on this, make it three repeating units. These bonds are really strong. They're really strong bonds. Now, what that means is because they're really strong, they can't be broken down. So in terms of recycling of uh, polyalkenes and addition polymers, which they're sometimes known as, um, in order to recycle, we reuse, we recycle, but we also do things like uh, melting and remolding. Uh, we also do, of course, another thing that's specifically on your... Um, oh. Uh, wait, so do we need to know the fifth Q for IGCSE? Is there a part of it in our spec for biodegradable polymers? You need to know, you need to know that polyalkenes are not biodegradable. That you do need to know for your GCSE. And therefore, you need to also know what we do with them, how we deal with them when they've been used. And so to use these, the problem is that we incinerate, incinerate to produce electricity. But the problem is with that, of course, there are toxic gases and carbon dioxide and CO2, which causes global warming. So you've got that as an issue. We've also got, we can also um, re melt and re we can recycle. This means, of course, less going to landfill. Just recycle. You don't need to know any details of recycling. There is actually two types of recycling. There's mechanical and feedstock, but you don't need to know any of that for your GCSE. You just need to know that we recycle, therefore less to landfill. Less to landfill. You need to know that one. But then you do need to know that polyesters, because you don't pick up polyesters. Polyesters are not the same. Polyesters have a different structure. Polyesters, polyester structure looks like this. This is the ester linkage, and I'll, I'll keep it really, really simple. Um, I'll keep it really simple for you. This is the polyester. Um, actually, you know, technically, you're not going to do it with that one. You're going to do it as a diode diol polyester for your thing. So there's the diodic, and here's the diol. I need an O on that side, like that. There we go. So this is your polyester. 
and polyesters are biodegradable. Um, do we need to know the fifth question? What was the fifth question on our thing? Have a quick look. Come on, laptop. Come on, there we go. Why are some condensation polymers biodegradable? Why and how? Uh, you need to know that they are, but you don't need to know why. But the explanation actually kind of makes sense. The reason being is if you notice the chain running down the center, what you notice is that the the chain is not entirely carbon hydrogen bonds. Sorry, ah, not entirely carbon carbon bonds. What we have here is carbon oxygen bonds. These bonds here are far weaker. We've also got a bond here which can easily be attacked. So what's actually happening is that these are biodegradable because what can happen is water can actually attack. Water can attack this and break the break the chain up. That's actually why. But as I said. Totally, un, you do not need to know that for your GCSE. You just need to know that they are biodegradable. Polyesters are considered biodegradable. They still take an awful lot of time. They still take 100 years. The first biodegradable polymer, which was a polyester, which was used to make the original disposable nappies, still takes 80 to 100 years to biodegrade. So they're still found in landfill sites today. It's just the fact that they're better than they're, they're better than the polyalkenes. Polyalkenes are just the worst kind of polymers in terms of biodegradability because they simply won't biodegrade. They will just last almost indefinitely. There's very little we can do about them. They actually get broken down by sunlight, so burying them actually extends their lifetime in the ground as well. It's not great. There really is problems with all of these plastics that we're dealing with these days. Okay. So let's go back to the questions. Next, so we've covered what makes them biodegradable. All you need to know is that they are. Close other tabs. It, isn't there a part of it in our spec for biodegradable polymers? Yes, I think there is. I think you just need to know of them. I can have a look for you if you like. My laptop is having a total meltdown currently. This is going to be a nightmare for me over the next coming few weeks as this gets harder. Let's see if I can. I don't know whether or not I can actually make this do what I want it to do. My laptop is having issues here, folks. Um, okay, so I'm looking at the specification later. Okay. Um, do we need to know the naming of alkenes after they've bonded with halogens? The answer is no. Uh, well, according to Edexcel, anyway, they say no. But there are a couple of questions that I've seen in the past that have suggested otherwise. But uh, the answer is you shouldn't have to name you shouldn't have to name any halo alkenes at all. You just need to know that they exist and be able to draw them. Those are what you do need to know. So in terms of halo alkenes, then all you need to know is that alkenes, alkenes are special because what they can do is they can pick up the halogens and of course the example being bromine water. So this is the molecule of bromine being Br2. I don't even know you were doing this with, with Rn. I don't know what that quite means, and So alkenes can react with bromine water. We know this. It is actually the chemical test for alkenes. And what happens is, of course, they bind together in what's called an addition reaction. It's an addition reaction, and it binds across the double bond. And Oliver, your question is really valid. Uh, oh, sorry, it's not bromine. It's not bromine. It's bromine. Uh, you do not need to name this, but... Uh, I do worry at times that they might. It's period four. Oh, is it period four? Have I overshot my time? I don't think so. Oh, yeah. Um, so they join together. The bromines go either side of the double bond. You shouldn't need to name this. If you want to know how to name it, this is one, two, dibromo ethane. Not complicated. You recognize that any group seven goes in front of it as a, if it's a CL, then it's a chloro. If it's a Br, then it's a bromo. If it's an I, it's an iodo, which is a funny one. 
ethics flow out. You do need to know a, a few of these, but at least recognize it. The reason being is there are some polymers that you just have to know. For example, PTFE. PTFE. P-T-F-E, which is poly tetrafluoroethene. And you actually need to know this guy. It's a, it's a polymer, of course, and it's not complicated. It tells you what it was made from. And of course, the problem is that students commonly put in a double bond, even though there isn't one there. It's a single bond. There's PTFE. But Oliver, you shouldn't have to name this. You shouldn't. Although I don't trust, I don't trust that Excel as far as I can throw them. I really don't. I feel like they're just going to cause trouble and they're going to ask you to do naming. It's the kind of thing where keep an eye out for those questions on an exam. And if you see one, I'm happy to do a webinar on how to actually go about naming them. I'm happy to do this. It's not particularly complicated either. So. Let's go back to the questions. You shouldn't have to name them, but you do need to be able to draw them. So I can go tick off that guy. Why does cracking need a catalyst? Oh, that's a great question. The answer is it doesn't. There are actually two types of cracking, but there's but the only one you learn at GCSE is what is called catalytic cracking. The catalyst just reduces the temperature. That is all, Oliver. That's all that this does. It just reduces the temperature needed for the cracking process. Because all we're going to do is we're going to break up a long chain and we're going to turn it into a shorter chain. And to break covalent bonds, you need lots of heat. But, of course, it would be useful if we can do this at a slightly lower temperature. Wouldn't you agree? Lower temperature simply means cost is, cost is lower. So... It doesn't need a, crack, a catalyst, but you do need to know the one that, and, and a specific one at that. You guys need to know that the catalyst for that is aluminum silicate, which is aluminium silicate. Or, by the way, and I actually don't like that name. What I'd prefer you to learn is zeolite. It's actually an easier word, than, but you do need to recognize that one because every now and again they'll name it. I don't want anyone to ever freak out about this. But it's called zeolite, and zeolite is the catalyst for cracking. Uh, by the way, it actually, um, clay, clay is aluminum silicate. So actually using clay pots actually works as the catalyst for this particular process. It's just the proper name for that material is zeolite. So, and why does it need it? It doesn't. It can happen at higher temperatures. It just reduces the temperature needed. <clears throat> just to explain that, it's quite nice to do it. That is, that is beyond GCSE, but it's nice for you to have it. So we take something like C16H, double it in add 2, 34, and we're going to crack it. We're going to crack this. We're going to do this at for Edexcel. Uh, 600 degrees Celsius with a zeolite catalyst. I don't like 600, by the way. I prefer for Alexa, stop. Sorry about that, folks. Alexa was chiming in there. Um, so cracking 600 degrees. I don't actually like 600. I prefer 450. It's a better temperature. Uh, zeolite, we need to do it with no air around because if there's air at that temperature, you're going to burn and we're going to crack this to make C8H, double it in up to 1618. There's my shorter alkane. Now, that's actually why we're doing it. Supply, why do we crack? We do it for one reason, and that's supply. Supply of short chains, short alkanes, is exceeded. Supply is, ex, is, is greater than the demand. No, no. Is the supply is less than the demand, so we have to make more. And then we get an alkene as a byproduct. So we're going to get, we might get multiple ones. C2, H4, how many do I need? I've lost, I need to get to H, I'm going to need four of those, that'll add up. But I'm going to make an alkene and a shorter alkane. So, and we could do that, the zeolite reduces the temperature. This is catalytic, this is part of catalytic cracking. This is actually part of AS level. 
catalytic cracking. There's also thermal, which is done at temperatures of 1,000 degrees Celsius. Cool. So I hope that answers your question. The answer is we don't, but we use it because it lowers the temperature, meaning it's easier. Next. Right. So why is phosphoric acid needed as the catalyst for the creation of ethanol? My laptop's having a small seizure. So why is phosphoric acid needed? You do not need to know this, Oliver. <laughs> I love your question. It's a great question. Uh, and it's nice to explain it to you properly. But in terms of why, so we take ethene. We take, ooh, gotta be careful there. We take ethene, and we react ethene, ethene gas, and we react it with steam, plus steam. Notice it is not water, H2O gas, steam, and in an equilibrium, we will get ethanol. Yeah, now the reason why this needs a catalyst is because the ethene doesn't like to react with the water molecules. The water molecules have electrons on the, uh, the oxygen has two lone pairs of electrons up here and they'll repel each other. So what you have to have is a catalyst. You have to have a catalyst in order to, to get this reaction. I'm going to actually draw it out. I don't like the fact that it's not like that. Just going to draw it out for you. Producing ethanol. Just to show you that one H goes there with the water. Yeah, if I was going to colour code this, that guy was there and that guy was there. They go across the double bond just like the halogens do. Uh, you do not need to know why, but if you want the real picture, Oliver, on the real picture, the, the real picture for this, my laptop is actually getting worse as time goes on. I don't really know what to do about that, I'm afraid. So, what's actually happening is you take ethene, you take ethene, and it reacts with phosphoric acid. This is what phosphoric acid looks like if you're interested. This is what phosphoric acid looks like. Now, phosphoric acid can react with the ethene and it forms this. This is this process, by the way, is from straight from AS level. There's the H that becomes fully positive to phosphoric acid. Oop, dropping into sulfuric. The phosphoric acid becomes fully negative. That now helps them. So you're actually getting the reaction between phosphoric acid and ethene first. And then what happens is once you've formed this intermediate, which is rather disgusting, the, my AS students have to be able to draw this and, and draw out this whole process. Now water can attack the carbon, now that the double bond's gone. The water goes on and that then breaks off. And I get back my phosphoric acid and I end up with the alcohol. So I don't want to go into too much depth and do that any further because I really don't need to. But it's nice for you to see why you actually need this. You do not need to know any descriptions, but you do need to be able to name it. That that's the process, that's the catalyst for that reaction. That's all. Why is sulfuric um, named as a catalyst for the uh, for the creation of esters? That's another great question, Oliver. The reason for that, uh, some students often ask, why phosphoric for ethanol, but sulfuric for the ester? You can actually use both of those acids for both of those processes. However. Ethanol is made on an enormous industrial scale, a process that just runs and runs and runs for hours on end. Um, and what that means is, what that means is they need the equipment to last a long time, and so they can't use sulfuric acid because sulfuric acid is just so damaging. So they switch to a slightly less damaging acid, which is phosphoric. But esters are made on a tiny scale. Esters you make so little of because you only need tiny amounts of it, whereas alcohol we need huge amounts of it because we burn it. Esters are artificial smells and flavors, but you only need a few drops of it. So we actually do this on a much smaller scale, so sulfuric acid is preferred. And unfortunately, once again, guys, you just have to know them. Those acids you're going to ask to name. When ethanol oxidizes, 
does it lose two hydrogens and forms a double bond with the oxygen to form a carboxylic acid? Like that question is actually well, a lot more complicated. Number 10 is a lot more complicated than you realize, Oliver. And I'm, I'm not, I don't want to go into too much detail again and do the A-level part of that. All you need to know, all you need to know is that when you oxidize an alcohol, when you, when you take your alcohol and you oxidize it with either, so if you oxidize it with, with air, yeah, with micro, microbes, <laughs> that's where you need your microbes to get this done from the air. That's going to ferment it. It's going to be microbial fermentation, microbial oxidation, not fermentation because I'm not making alcohol. It's microbial oxidation and it's going to become a carboxylic acid. That's all you need to know. That's it. Yeah. Um, and I wouldn't overthink it. You actually get water as a byproduct as well, but I, I don't really want you to worry about that overly. Um, that actually covers all of your questions at that point. What I'm going to do is, since my laptop is just struggling a little bit right now, I'm just going to end today's lesson at that point and say, you 11, can you do me a favour? I'm going to drop back to you guys being able to see me. Here back to that one. There we go. Bye, guys. Uh, I hope you found it useful. Uh, what I'm also going to do is uh, I've got a whole load of exam questions that I want to go through as well. I'm actually going to do that tomorrow instead of doing it today. Uh, I'm going to do that one tomorrow uh, and go through these exam questions about alkenes and polymers, etc. Because I've already done 45 minutes and I don't want this to be going on because otherwise it becomes very boring. So I will just do those. Any more questions, please feel free to email me and I will run through them on the lesson. Right, guys, I will see you guys tomorrow. Have a good day.